Good morning, everyone. Good to be with you on this Wednesday, April the 8th. We are in the middle of Holy Week with uh, what's called the Easter Triduum. Fancy word just means three days. And that is uh, starting tomorrow. It's an ancient tradition in the church starting on Monday, Thursday, or what's called Holy Thursday in some traditions, extending through Good Friday and uh, Saturday, and of course, uh, leading to Easter Sunday, which is this coming Sunday. As I've announced on several occasions on Facebook Live, we will be having a service released, a worship movie released tomorrow night at seven o'clock for Monday, Thursday. It will be a service of tenebrae, a service of shadows, where I will be offering readings from scripture that will be interspersed with uh, music. Um, and we read through the story and extinguish candles with, uh, with each reading. So that'll be tomorrow night, Monday, Thursday. Uh, Monday, by the way, is a word that uh, comes from a Latin word, mandatum, which means command, commandment, uh, and it commemorates Jesus giving us a new commandment to love one another. Uh, so Monday, Thursday is, uh, is an important day on the Christian calendar. And of course, we also remember how uh, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper on Monday, Thursday, and how he washed the disciples' feet. So that's tomorrow evening. Uh, Thursday evening at 7 o'clock, that worship movie will be released. And then Good Friday, we have a special um, video that we're releasing at 12 noon. Uh, it's not done by us, but it's done very well by a Roman Catholic church that posted it on YouTube, and it's the Stations of the Cross. And uh, we felt it was really well done and wanted to share that with um with members of uh, First Church. So if you have, it's about 20, 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes. If you have time on Good Friday and want to focus on the hours between 12 and three, when traditionally we believe Jesus was uh, crucified on that day, um, this is a nice contemplative um, devotional actually, about 20, 25 minute devotional on Good Friday from 12, starting at 12, it'll be released on, on both of our platforms, Facebook and YouTube. So you can uh, check those out on Good Friday. And then, of course, Easter is on Sunday, and we'll be releasing our special worship movie at 9.30 on Sunday, as we do every Sunday. So hopefully you're able to join in at 9.30, or you can always watch any of these services afterwards because they stay on both of our platforms. Just search out First United Methodist Church of Morristown on YouTube or on Facebook to get those worship opportunities. Uh, as we head into what is the most... Uh, important time in the Christian calendar, and uh, we look forward to uh, worshiping in this way, even though we can't be together, uh, obviously, still as we continue through the coronavirus pandemic. Um, I have some really good news to share with you. Uh, we had a staff meeting yesterday, a very productive staff meeting, and talking mostly about elements for the Easter service and some other things as well. But uh, joining us on that Zoom staff meeting call was Joan Flamini, and Joan is officially uh, back with us. Uh, she has been cleared by her, uh, her doctors to come back, and she is uh, officially back in capacity, um, you know, getting into it, I'd say, or easing into it in some ways, uh, but she's, she is back, and of course, still working out of her home, as we all are, so that part doesn't change. Uh, Joan is working, um, and Dennis is helping her with some of the technological things, so it's great to have Joan. It's great just to see her and have her back uh, with the staff. And Joan sends her best and we send our best and our love to her as well as she uh, uh, takes this next step in her recovery from cancer. So it's, uh, it's a, it was a joyous day yesterday to see her and she's uh, just, uh, just delighted, just delighted to um, be able to be productive, I think is the way she put it. She's very happy to be uh, productive. So that's, uh, and, and of course, going stir crazy as many of us are on occasion. Um, luckily, I'm, I'm busy, so that's good. I mean, the days are flying by for me just with work with the conference and of course putting worship together and trying to keep uh, uh, other things, um, connections with people in the church as well. So for the most part, that's good. But there are times when you do go stir crazy being in, in the house, um, uh, just being in this isolation, it's difficult to, uh, actually went out for, yes, it was a beautiful day, unlike today is a little bit, a little bit of a downer, but um, yesterday was a beautiful day. It was in the 60s. It was fantastic. So I uh, went out for, for a run and I hadn't done that in a long time because, of course, my gym is closed, so I can't go to the gym. 
So I try to improvise in other ways. Keeping active, going out for runs and walks, and uh, hadn't run in a while, and it really showed. I could not do too well. I was doing some intervals, and that's about it. Run for a bit, and then walk for twice that amount, and then run a little bit more, and then walk again. So, But it was good to be out, and, and there are a lot of people out, and it's great uh, in this community here. People are just out and saying hi to each other, and even though we're passing by six feet sometimes, and then coming back or going to the other side of the street to make sure that we're not uh, too close to one another. Everyone understands that this is just something we need to do. Nothing personal, of course. And uh, yeah, and that's what we're we're doing. So, but everyone's real friendly and just saying hi and checking in and how you doing. And um, it's it's a nice feeling. It's a nice community feeling. And hopefully that's something good that's coming out of this uh, this time that we're in. So that's a good thing. Uh, one more thing I want to mention uh, with Joan back now. That means that uh, Jane Kanicki, who had been filling in for, for Joan in some ways and helping out Karen in the office um, in a temporary capacity, which we always always knew, um, she'll no longer be uh, working in the office. And, and Joan, um, I'm sorry, Jane did this. We've got a Joan and a Jane. Jane did this for uh, several, several weeks. And I just, uh, I'm so grateful for her. Um, her willingness to do this and uh, just assisting in so many different ways in the office. She did a great job. She's a quick learner. It was wonderful. It was a lot to take in um, just with the work on the computer and um, you know stuffing bulletins and putting things together and uh, connecting with people and knowing where to, to funnel phone calls and all that good stuff. Uh, Jane was just just excellent and I can't say enough good things about Jane Kanicki and her filling in for for Joan during this time and you know we we may call upon Jane again sometime in the future if she's willing to help us out with some things in the office so Jane we love you and we really appreciate all your efforts so thanks again for that um, so that's sort of an update from our staff meeting yesterday we had, do have some special services that we're going to be working on one thing we talked about yesterday is that our worship services um, by necessity are kind of into a routine right so we have uh, we're ringing the bell in the beginning, which was a new addition, which I really love. Um, and then an opening uh, announcements and welcoming, followed by a prayer, followed by maybe some music, and then scripture, sermon. Um, we're, doing that on, uh, we're doing that this Sunday. But we're trying to do some additional things as well. Uh, things maybe to mix it up a little bit on Sundays. We're talking about possibly having a Sunday dedicated to music, for instance. Or a Sunday, we're thinking about Mother's Day, having our... A couple of our youth offer some recorded messages, as we've done in the past. Um, and we may be, and we're still working on this, I'm still thinking about it, we're going to ask families, perhaps, to record with your, your phones, to record short clips of, and it's totally voluntary, of course, but um, anyone who wants to record a short clip, especially families, of um, just a greeting to their other church members, and perhaps just tell us something that they've been doing that's fun during this time of uh, quarantine. Um, might be a nice way, and we'll share those. And to keep them very short, very brief, because if we get a lot of them, uh, we want to include them in the worship uh, experience as well. But more information will come out in an email uh, regarding that uh, either this week or next week. Okay, so that's sort of an update on some worship ideas that we're doing. And uh, so we're continuing to try to think out of the box and, and try to do some, some different things here at First Church. So my good mornings, and here I, I feel like the romper room lady again, but uh, I see, uh, I wish I had that, what was that that she used? A, um, it was a mirror, I guess, a magic mirror or something, and she'd look out there, I don't know if you remember that show. But anyway, I see Marilyn has joined us, and Marilyn, I hope you and your family are doing well, and uh, Kurt, you're on also, good to see you as well. And Tracy, you've been uh, faithful just about every day <laughs> watching uh, these Facebook Live posts and hope your kids enjoyed the uh, resurrection eggs that we started yesterday at children's uh, time in the afternoon. I'll be doing more today. Um, I did two yesterday, the donkey and the, the gold coins or silver coins. Um, the donkey, of course, representing Palm Sunday and uh, good. They did enjoy it. Great. Um, and also the, the silver coins representing uh, Judas's betrayal of Jesus. So we're going to share the story through these resurrection eggs um, every day, and it's geared towards the kids, of course, but you know anyone's free to watch it. I, I do gear it towards the kids and try to keep the story simple for them so they understand what it means to go through Holy Week. So we'll do two more eggs today, and then two more tomorrow, and Friday, and Saturday, and we'll, we'll eventually get to Easter, and, and that ought to be a lot of fun. So that's the plan for that. 
So now turning to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John. Yesterday we transitioned and we returned back to Galilee kind of unexpectedly in the Gospel of John in chapter 6 after Jesus had been in Jerusalem and the odd transitional verse we talked about, chapter 6, verse 1, how all of a sudden now Jesus is in Galilee and he's crossing to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. We talked about that. And Jesus is going to uh, perform another sign, and this is the feeding of the 5,000. And we talked about how this is in all four Gospels. Uh, this is the only miracle, by the way, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure, the only miracle that occurs in all four of the Gospels. There are other things that occur in all four of the Gospels, but this is the only miracle that occurs. So we uh, we talked about how, uh, and we did a little comparison. I, I, I brought you into a little bit of biblical criticism yesterday. By the way, criticism in Bible studies is not a dirty word, okay? It just means a comparison of the text, a critical look at the text, if you will, and not a pejorative way. Uh, just uh, uh, trying to understand where the text comes from, how it relates to other texts, um, comparing and contrasting the Gospels. And that's what we did yesterday with John and Mark, is what we lifted up in particular, um, in the feeding of the 5,000 story. And we, we very, very um, minute point, but we talked about how Mark mentions green grass that Jesus made the people sit down in before the feeding miracle occurs in the story. Green grass, whereas John talks about just having them sit on grass. And in that part of the world, which is uh, the Golan Heights area in current modern day Israel, um, this would have been scrub grass, uh, dark grass, um, not burnt, but that kind of, kind of, you know, brownish type of grass. So the fact that Mark adds green in his story, we talked about a little bit. Um, and also we looked at a, and very tangentially, we looked at another story that both John and, and Mark have, and that's the, what's called the anointing traditions, where a woman in various settings comes to Jesus and she, uh, she anoints Jesus's feet or his head and in some versions she cries on Jesus feet and but I believe it's in all the versions that she actually uses her hair to wipe down Jesus feet in some ways um, it's all referring to the same thing but the way that these stories work is kind of like a game of telephone in some ways and so the story morphs and changes a bit because we're talking uh, a long time when these stories are being transmitted orally. They were not written down until quite, uh, quite a few years later. So as the oral tradition develops, right before the written tradition occurs, the stories kind of morph and change a little bit, and, and the gospel writers tell it nuanced um, uh, a little bit differently, okay? And so the anointing tradition is one of those that has uh, distinct uh, features that um, are unique to each story, but also a common a common theme, a common way to tell the story. So anyway, we talked about the green grass versus the grass, Mark versus John. There's another instance of this in the anointing tradition where in Mark, the woman anoints Jesus' head and in John, the woman anoints Jesus' feet. And, uh, and it's interesting, it's a long, long uh, study of scripture, but Luke has sort of a, um, a, a combined version of both of those, and Matthew always sort of follows Mark with these things, so they're all just a little bit different. Anyway, we talked about that, and we said, why would Mark have green grass, and why would um, John just have grass, and why would Mark have the woman anointing the head, whereas Luke, I'm sorry, John, has the woman anointing the feet? We talked a little bit about how the 23rd Psalm might enter into this. And uh, if you think of the words of the 23rd Psalm, it seems like Mark is following the example of the 23rd Psalm, whereas John's version of the story might just be following the story itself. So um, we see how gospel writers are sometimes influenced theologically by other portions of Scripture, and that might be what's happening with Mark. So um, we're going to see that again today, actually, as in all the traditions except for Luke, Yes, uh, Matthew, Mark, and John all have the feeding of the 5,000. Boy, I sure hope I'm right about that. I'm pretty sure I'm right about that. Matthew, Mark, and John all have the following story. After the feeding of the 5,000, the next story is Jesus walking on the water or calming the storm, which is, uh, is interesting that 
and we'll talk about this in a moment, but John doesn't really say that Jesus calms the storm, whereas Matthew and Mark do. Um, so, very interesting. So, beginning then in verse 16, what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to read the story and uh, offer some uh, comments about it. So, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the Sea of Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. Uh, the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus. I got a call in, so I had to pause for a moment. So let me read again verse 18. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. Very uh, short um, story. Um, kind of interesting that it is placed here, and John's not the only author who, who does this, uh, who places the Jesus walking on the water right after the feeding of the 5,000. The others do as well. All of the synoptics do, um, except for Luke, as I said. But what happens here, and it's, it's curious in John why John does this. John must have inherited this tradition maybe from a source or was just common knowledge, because then immediately after this story, John goes back to talking about the bread from heaven which fits in with the feeding of the 5,000 perfectly. So why wouldn't the bread of heaven discourse, right? What Jesus talks about as being the bread from heaven. Why wouldn't that follow immediately on the feeding of the 5,000? Why is this story, this nat nature miracle in essence, why is it placed in this middle spot between the feeding of the 5,000 and the bread from heaven? Traditionally, um, I'm sure that's the way the stories were told, and John inherits that, as I said, maybe from a source or where it's just common knowledge, so that's why it kind of fits in there. But let's talk a little bit about the text itself. Um, that first verse, verse 17, that I, I read, or the second verse actually, verse 17, really is better translated as they were trying to cross the sea. They were having some difficulty. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that there was a... Um, you know, they just were having trouble getting across because of the rough seas or some other reason. Who knows? But that's a better uh, translation of the Greek than what we have here, I think. Anyway, got into the boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. Uh, they were trying, trying. There's an effort here, okay? And then verse 19, uh, we read about the distance, right? When they had rowed about three or four miles. And if you have a Bible, you'll see there's a footnote there probably under three or four miles. Um, so where were they on, on the sea? Where were they on the, on the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias? Well, actually, the Greek talks about a, uh, a stadium, which is a measurement that was used back then, about 25 or 30 stadia. Stadia is the plural. 25 or 30 stadia, which is the equivalent of three or four miles. And the Sea of Galilee, at its, uh, at its widest point, was about 61 stadia, which is about seven miles or so, okay? And uh, that's its widest point. So the disciples, if you can picture this, and it makes sense, at this point they were right in the middle of the lake, more or less, okay? Give or take a little, but they were right in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. So, and, and the evangelist has a, a, a miracle in mind here. And as I said, it's a nature miracle in the way that he tells the story. Now, for what reason? That's something else we could talk about. What is the purpose behind telling this story now in this place, okay? Anyway, verse 21, the last verse, interesting tidbit here, um, the arrival of both the boat and the passengers at the other side of the sea, the destination. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. So let's make some observations about this, maybe to help clear some things up. As I said before, why did the evangelist, John, right, why did he include this incident in this point in the narrative? Okay. Um, in the versions of this miracle that are given by Matthew and, and Mark, remember, Jesus calms the sea, and that is the miraculous part of the story. Jesus actually calms the sea and gets into the boat. That's clear in Matthew and Mark. And as I said, this is a, a nature miracle, which kind of is intended to show that Jesus has power over even nature, over creation, uh, and the disciples are rescued from this storm. All right, that's... That's Matthew and Mark. John doesn't even really mention these things, does he? 
we, we just read through this. It's not even clear if Jesus gets into the boat. It doesn't say that. All it says in verse 21 is they wanted to take him into the boat. In fact, that might suggest that Jesus didn't get into the boat. And immediately, that word immediately, the boat reached the land towards which they were going on the other side. Okay, So it doesn't really say Jesus got into the boat there. Um, so why does John include this miracle then in a slightly altered way? As I said before, this bread of life discourse, the bread from heaven, is following this story, but wouldn't it follow much better on the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000? Why does John include this in this spot and in this place? Uh, and as I said, maybe it was linked to, these stories were linked in ancient tradition, in the oral tradition, before the Gospels were written down, so the evangelist is just following along what he knows. That could be. That could very well be. Um, he just knows it from the tradition, or it may have been in his source, as I, I said before. Um, so, and interesting, I mentioned before that uh, this story also follows in uh, Matthew and in Mark, in Matthew 14 and Mark chapter 6, but it doesn't follow in Luke chapter 9, which is interesting. Luke goes in a very different direction here for some reason. So, maybe the evangelist is just following tradition. Maybe Luke changed it, or Luke didn't pick up on that for whatever reason, but they are, they are different. Um, so, let's see, what else? Uh... There could be other reasons as well for John, including this uh, story, uh, the walking on the water. Maybe it um, has to do with uh, Jesus. Remember, Jesus has a very um, high Christology, or actually the evangelist, John, has a very high Christology, high understanding of Jesus here. And we know that because John often uses this term ego and me in Greek, which means I am. We talked about that being the divine name, right? So when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he's using the divine name. And these I am sayings repeat constantly in John's gospel. And so maybe John wants to make sure this story is included because it is, as I said, a nature miracle. And Jesus is showing authority even over creation. And this would, this would uh, lead people to believe that um, Jesus is to be equated with the Creator in some ways. And remember we talked about the Trinitarian formula a couple days ago being introduced in an earlier chapter here. So maybe that's why John wants to continue to include it in this point. Just to make people aware that these I Am sayings really are talking about Jesus linked with uh, the Creator or the Father, right, as, as Jesus would say. Um, also there's the symbolism of water and the sea, which is uh, in the Old Testament, you may remember, it's a symbol of evil and chaos. Certainly the case in the prophet Isaiah, but also in the creation story itself. There was this chaotic situation of the primordial waters that uh, God reigns over, the creator reigns over and changes into, um, uh, brings order to it in the creation story. So maybe that uh, also carries some significance here for John. Um, so, and remember here too, what we talked about, uh, Jesus being much more than a political Messiah. And then at the end of the feeding story, uh, they wanted to force him as the word is used, force him to become the king, which is really interesting too. So John wants to make sure that we understand the full meaning of Messiahship here. And as I said, this can be summed up in the I am, uh, phrases that John uses over and over again to describe, uh, Jesus. So, um, so the disciples place their trust in Jesus as the Messiah, and uh, they are overwhelmed by this uh, miracle, which Jesus walks on the water, and he's controlling even creation. But I want to get back to that other point that I, I had mentioned before, just briefly, and again, bringing in the 23rd Psalm. Um, John, in this story, unlike Matthew and Mark, doesn't have Jesus calming the storm. So I'll compare Mark and John again, because really Matthew always follows Mark. Why would that be? Why would this story not include a calming of the storm? Hmm. Again, think about the 23rd Psalm. We talked about uh, the green grass, and maybe we should go back to the 23rd Psalm quickly just to highlight some of this, which is right back here somewhere. In the 23rd Psalm, and remember we, we suggested yesterday, and of course you can't prove any of this, but we suggested that maybe, maybe Mark in his telling of the stories of Jesus, at least these signs or miracles, is wanting to connect Jesus with some of the points of the 23rd Psalm. So you remember, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in 
green pastures. Mark uses the word green to describe where the uh, crowd sat for the feeding miracle. Uh, what's the next line after that? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside what kind of waters? Still waters, calm waters. Mark has Jesus calming the storm. John really doesn't. Uh, is Mark here again showing an affinity for Psalm 23, looking through the lens of Psalm 23 and telling the stories of, uh, of Jesus' miracles? It's just a theory. It's an interesting theory, I think. And then, of course, the third one, which uh, if we were to go through it all again, uh, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Psalm 23 says, you anoint my head with oil. Why does Mark have that woman anoint Jesus' head, whereas John remembers it as the feet that are being anointed? Again, don't know. Uh, just a theory, but perhaps Mark is using the lens of Psalm 23. And it's interesting to see if there are other examples of that as, as well. Um, something to think about, and again, this is a little brief introduction to what we do in biblical criticism. Criticism is not a nasty word, remember that? <laughs> it's a word that helps us to get behind the text and find out where, uh, where they're coming from. Because remember, all this was oral tradition when it started. People told stories around fires, and the stories of Jesus were shared in this way too, until eventually they were, uh, they were written down. So that could be the case here. Well, we're going to leave it off right there with uh, Jesus walking on the water, and we'll return back to the theme of bread um, tomorrow with the narrative about the bread from heaven, and Jesus in the I Am saying, uh, telling, uh, telling the disciples, I am the bread of life. Okay, so everyone have a great day today. I'm glad you were able to join in. Um, again, this afternoon, around two-ish is my hope. We'll see how the day goes. Hold on a second. Around 2 o'clock, we're going to get back to telling the story of Holy Week using our eggs. We had the blue egg yesterday and the pink egg yesterday, the donkey and the silver coins. Today, we'll be opening up this sort of uh, lavender, lavender-colored egg and uh, definitely an orange egg, and we'll see what's in those later. And this is, as I said, designed for the kids, um, so look for me around 2-ish or so, maybe maybe 1.30. We'll see how it goes. But you don't have to watch it uh, live. You can always see it uh, recorded on our Facebook live platform, on our, our Facebook page for First United Methodist Church of Morristown. All right, so that'll be a little bit later today. We're working on some other things today with the conference and um, Board of Ordained Ministry, all good stuff happening. So uh, I hope you all have a wonderful day today. I hope you are, uh, are blessed in a way that maybe you don't anticipate. So everyone be well. Grace and peace.